It's your boy Nefakari Dessaline back in the building. Yes, indeed. And today we're going to talk about why did Jean-Jacques Dessalines authorize the massacre of 1804? Let's get into it. Now, this is going to be a controversial topic. This is going to be a controversial topic because, number one, the perspective from which it is told is from the European perspective. So today we're going to give it from the African perspective. Today we're going to give it from the black man perspective. Today we're going to give it from the African man perspective. Today we're going to give it from the rebel perspective. You know, the, re the, the perspective that's never told, the perspective that's never written down, the perspective that's never acknowledged. And we're just going to, you know, dive into it. And, uh, you know, if you are of <laughs> non-African descent, you might get triggered, but it is what it is. You came in and you stayed. So take a seat. Let's get into it. Now, before we even get started, we got to give you the setting. We got to give you the background of what made this possible and the mindset of the men that authorized this operation. The year 1804 is a year that rings in the hearts of all black people around the world. We know what happened in 1804. The black man reigned supreme. The year marked 13 years of battle loss bloodshed losing family members losing best friends losing soldiers losing generals losing captains losing women losing children losing everything you love losing everything you had just to finally get the thing that they called independence when you think of the haitian revolution you think of toussaint louverture but by this time toussaint has already been dead going on to a year but his arrest capture and deportation happened about two years prior so by this time the island is in full control by general jean-jacques Dessalines. And when you think of the position of head of state, the position of the leader of the nation, Judge like Dessalines, his function was the shooter. When Toussaint needed somebody knocked off, when Toussaint needed somebody eliminated by sunset, he called Judge like Dessalines. That was his role. That was his function. When an army of men needed to be raised to go lay siege to a city, he called Judge like Dessalines. Toussaint was the political genius. Toussaint was the OG. You got to understand, he was up in his 60s, I believe. This was an elder, all right? You have to understand, Dessalines, he was a young bull, you know, 30s, 40s. And Dessalines, second in command, only Christophe, he was even younger. I believe he was in his early 30s. And going back to 1791, when the revolution originally popped off, Christophe was in his early 20s. He was a young bull. And Toussaint was the elder who controlled all these young shooters. But by this time, Toussaint been gone close to two years. So one of the biggest mistakes made by the French government was you eliminated somebody who actually believed in diplomacy who actually believed in sitting down at the negotiation table like men you know over dinner smoking cigars sipping wine and discussing things and coming to an agreement they eliminated Toussaint they deported him and they assassinated him right so you have to understand he was the one that kept these young shooters back from pretty much taking the French population and grinding them down to dust right you had all these young shooters that were ready for whatever at any time at any given place they really did didn't care and Toussaint was the one who was able to control them he was the only one that they respected he was the only one that they would answer to they wouldn't answer to nobody else so when they eliminated him and they allowed these young shooters to pretty much take the reins to pretty much grab control of the island the ones that did not believe in diplomacy the ones that did not believe in negotiation the ones that did not believe in friendship and reconciliation that was probably their biggest mistake and the reason why they lost the island shortly after and why Dessalines pretty much drove everyone to victory as soon as Toussaint got deported, you know, the French lost as soon as Toussaint left, you know, it was pretty much full on attack, full on offense blast. And the French pretty much had to get ran out of town. So we're going to go into the mistakes that the French made during the Haitian Revolution in another time. But that was one of the biggest blunders. You allowed Dessalines to become the head of state. Are you kidding me? It's done for you. It's a wrap for you. Toussaint would have never authorized the assassination of the majority French population. He wouldn't have done that for political reasons. He believed in negotiating with other countries. He believed in the PR and the image of a country. He was a political genius in every sense of the word. The greatest black politicians ever walked the earth a hundred times better than Barack Obama. And we got to get into his political genius in another video as well. And the reason why Toussaint and Dessalines made such a perfect duo, because it was like good cop, bad cop. You had Toussaint who believed in negotiation, who believed in sitting down and coming to an agreement. And if you couldn't come down to an agreement, listen, he got Dessalines on speed dial and he'll have your whole city under lockdown under occupation getting burned down by the time you arrive to it later that night and this was pretty much the key to Toussaint's power this is why he always got what he want in every negotiation he launched with every government from the British government to the Spanish government to the French government because if you don't admit physically in this negotiation to agree to my terms then I am going to lay siege I'm going to raise up the entire enslaved population and we're not talking about a few hundred people at a protest you know what I mean with uh you know some signs and some 
you know some cardboard we are talking about 50,000 to 70,000 to maybe a hundred thousand people up in arms are you kidding me bro like bro this is a man who had uh, over a hundred thousand people he could raise up men women and children at any given time as soon as he said a word bro so he got everything he wanted in every negotiation he ever launched between every European government. Something else that is very rarely acknowledged is the fact that during the Haitian Revolution, the French women who were left behind, you know, when their fathers and their brothers and their sons pretty much got ran out of town, there were many wealthy French women that stayed behind on the island for whatever reason. And when the black men became the ruling class, you know, guess what happened? Yeah, you know, Toussaint and Dessaline and Christophe, yeah, they had, they had some white hoes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> They had some white hoes, you know what I'm saying? Some wealthy white hoes, you know what I'm saying? With connections back to the back to the French capital, you know, with money, you know, going back generations, and with property all over the island, you know what I mean? So, the, you know, the, by, by the time it was 1804, you gotta understand, the black men were multi-millionaires many times over. Dessaline, Christophe, Toussaint as well, Toussaint as well. And Toussaint was actually planning to use his millions. He had millions scattered all over, all over in American banks, you know, buried up in the mountains, all up in different properties. And in fact, he wanted to, go back and send ambassadors to africa to hopefully set up a colony there now i don't know how he would have done that because the slave trade was still going on that probably would have led to some you know intense conflict in the history books would have been amazing to see how that would have turned out but that's how toussaint planned to use his cash that he accumulated during the haitian revolution and unfortunately when toussaint passed away all the money that he had in american banks they never returned it obviously um some of that money actually went to building american educational institutions i believe gerard college is actually one of them that was built with two cents money that he never got returned back to the Haitian government and um you know probably a whole other different infrastructure projects that were built in North America during that time man you have to understand two cents had a lot of connections to the American government they rocked with him for whatever reason the Americans in power you know John Adams you know Alexander Hamilton they rocked with two cents I don't know why you know what I mean that was you know they they had something going on you know American warships were pulling up to the island you know providing support to the Haitian military you know it was some type of thing they had going on you know two cents had millions all up in you know North American banks um, when they first got started in the early 1800s so you know it's so much information that they don't tell us about but that's the nature of politics because you have to understand during that time the United States they had beef with the French so you know as politics goes oh we got beef with the French let's click up with Toussaint you know what I mean Toussaint got beef with the French you know what I mean so it's a perfect alliance for during that time but as we know regime change administration change when Thomas Jefferson came to power all of that stopped all of that got cut off embargoes all types of ban on trade didn't acknowledge them as an independent nation for decades man it was just insane but that's what happens when a regime change happens and i say all this to pretty much lay the foundation of the context so you get a picture of the situation the pretext and what led up to it something else that must be acknowledged is that these are men that are coming out of the institution of slavery and they're witnessing how do you enact punishment against a group of people they grew up since they were babies some who were born into slavery like Toussaint, some who may have been imported into slavery and they witnessed that when you want to handle somebody with punishment you pretty much assassinate them that's what they witnessed being done to them for generations upon generations upon generations they imagine that when you enact punishment when you enact vengeance when you enact quote-unquote justice that is how you enact justice by taking life because they witness the europeans on a daily basis take life and in fact this was reinforced by the speeches and the motivation that was given prior to the soldiers going city to city town to town commune to commune and taking life this was some of the words by the generals. I believe Christoph was one of the main ones who were providing inspiration and motivation to the generals. And this is what he said. Have they not hung up men with heads downwards, drowned them in sacks, crucified them on planks, buried them alive, crushed them in mortars? Have they not forced them to consume feces and having flayed them with the lash? Have they not cast them alive to be devoured by worms or onto ant hills or lashed them to stakes in the swamp to be devoured by mosquitoes? Have they not thrown them into boiling cauldrons of cane syrup? Have they not put men and women inside barrels studded with spikes and rolled them down mountainsides into the abyss? Have they not consigned these miserable blacks to man-eating dogs until the latter Sated by human flesh left the mangled victims to be finished off with the bayonet. This was just one of the many speeches that were given to provide motivation, to provide justification to the operation that was about to take place. And just like in the beginning, when I said it was told from the European perspective, I say that because this is classified as a quote unquote genocide, right? Only a few thousand people died. But on our side, when you go back to the founding of the colony, it was close to 5 million people on our side that died. So even if you tally up the few thousand that died against the 5 million, 
in my opinion, you know, this might be controversial. And I say this, you know, in my personal circles only. I don't really say this out in public because some people might get triggered. But in my opinion, it wasn't enough. But anyways, let's get back to the story. During February and March, Dessaline traveled among the cities of Haiti to assure himself that his orders were carried out. Despite his orders, the massacres were often not carried out until he visited the cities in person. Yep, one of the main challenges that Dessaline inherited when he became head of state is that he did not have that elder respect that Toussaint had. He was pretty much of the same age of most of the top ranked generals, maybe just a little older. He wasn't much older in terms of an elder. So when he handed out orders, sometimes they were not carried out to 100% satisfaction unless he showed up in person. And this is not a problem that Toussaint ever had. When he gave out an order, it was done. It was complete and it was successful. If Toussaint was still alive and he gave the order for the 1804 massacre, it would have been done, bro. It would have been done. It wouldn't have took months. It would have took like one month and it would have been complete. And every, you know, European on the island minus the, you know, the doctors and the, you know, the elite intellectuals, they would have all been eliminated with no worries. And this is going a little off topic, but I also think the reason why Dessaline was assassinated was because he did not have that elder respect. Toussaint would have never been tried for assassination and the only person that tried to assassinate him was the rich southern slave owning land owning mulattoes from the south led by Andre Rigaud. He was never going to be assassinated from within his ranks like Dessaline got assassinated. That's because Dessaline was seen as a peer. He was seen as a fellow soldier. He was seen as a fellow former enslaved African. Like we were both on a plantation, you know, picking the sugar cane, bro. Like, you know, you not bigger than me. So it was different for Toussaint because Toussaint, even back in the slavery days, he had an elite position in, on the island for a black man. So he was always a cut above the rest mentally, intellectually, financially, socially, just all around, all around the board, bro. And in my opinion, the only one that could come close to two cents political genius, military genius would be General Henri Christophe. Yes, the young boy, Henri Christophe had that same diplomacy, that same political genius, that same smoothness, that same attention to image and detail that two cent had. Dessaline was supposed to be the head of the military, the commander in chief of the military and the armed forces and the land and sea forces. That is what the position that Dessaline should have had. He was not supposed to be the head of state. Christophe was supposed to be the head of state. Dessaline was supposed to be the head of the military. Dessaline was a military man. Dessaline was a general. Dessaline was a shooter. Dessaline was a gangster. Dessaline was not a head of state. You know, Dessaline was not supposed to be in the political office negotiating with other governments. Dessaline was supposed to be, you know, in a military barracks, you know, smoking a cigar gar you know what i mean you know smashing the hose you know doing this thing <laughs> like you know what i mean that's lee was supposed to be the big chief on the island the big gangster the big shooter the big commander the big general he was not supposed to be you know the you know president of the nation you know he was not a head of state he was a military commander the course of the massacre showed an almost identical pattern in every city he visited. Before his arrival, there were only a few killings despite his orders. When Dessaline arrived, he first spoke about the atrocities committed by the former white authorities, such as Rochambeau and Leclerc, after which he demanded that his orders about mass killings of the area's white population should be put into effect. Reportedly, he ordered the unwilling to take part in the killings, especially the men of the mixed race. Oh, man, you gotta understand. Dessaline, listen, Dessaline, if he was alive today, he would be one of these brothers that, you know, would be on Twitter talking about, you know what I'm saying? Y'all don't like dark skinned women and y'all don't appreciate dark skinned women and y'all love the light skinned women. You know what I'm saying? He would be on his Dr. Umar. He would be on his pro black. He, that, that, that is what he would be if he was alive in the present day. Because listen, uh, Dessaline, he was the, you know, quintessential, uh, pro black man. Um, he was very race conscious. Uh, he was born into it. He was born into the institution of slavery. How could you not be race conscious? You know, the position and the tension that he held with the men of the mixed race. He always had a chip on his shoulder because he felt like, man, I came from the, I came from the sugarcane plantations. You know what I mean? The men of mixed race, they came from Paris. They went from, you know, Paris academies and military academies and universities and owning land and businesses. And, you know, they got white daddies and they white daddy, you know, rich planters, you know, and big men back in Paris. So, you know, Dessaline, you know, it was always tension between men like Dessaline and men like, you know, uh, Andre Rigaud and men like, you know, Jean-Pierre Boyer and even men like Alexander Pichon because they came from, you know, different walks of life. Um, and Dessaline was very, uh, you know, emotional about that. And as a man, Dessaline was emotional. Yes, he was. But then again, like I said, he is a military man. He's a military commander. He's not supposed to be a head of state. You know, he's not supposed to be in the political office giving out orders. He's supposed to be carrying out orders, you know, by the head of state working alongside the head of state, just like when he was working alongside Toussaint, who was the head of state, he was the military chief. So you have to understand, yes, he made the men of the mixed race carry out the uh, assassinations. 
probably to troll them, especially because the members of the white population were also members of their family. So just to, you know, get at them a little bit, you know, he made them get on the front lines and, you know, take the blame for it. Because when the heat came back, that's something did not hide it from other governments. When the Americans found out, when the Spanish found out, when the British found out, it wasn't something that was kept under wraps like how China does. You know, when China does something, you know, they go in the media, they lie about it. You know, they make up the numbers. That's something didn't lie about it. He was like, yeah, yeah, we did that. Oh, yeah. You heard that, uh, uh, you know, a few thousand, you know, men, women and children, you know, died here. Some Europeans died here. Definitely was like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we did that. Yeah, we did that. He actually gave out a public address to the world and was like, yeah, yeah, yeah we enacted vengeance. You know, so that's Celine, you know, he was the, you know, big chief, man, big gangster, you know, big gangster, big chief. That's Celine, you know, um, black man ain't moving like that in the present day. You know, we ain't seen nothing like that in, in a minute. You know, a black man who really let his nuts hang to the fullest effect. Now, within the mixed race population, it was a spectrum. You had men on one side of the mixed race population who were fully European identified, bleached their skin, wore wigs, wore white wigs, passed for white, pretty much never acknowledged their African side, never acknowledged their African mother, never acknowledged their African siblings. And then you had men in the middle who were fully embraced in the European culture, but also kind of embraced some of the African culture. Some of them would go down to the voodoo ceremony. Some of them would have black wives. Some of them would have biracial children, like, well, not biracial children, but, you know, children that were, you know, 75% black, you know, black wife, things like that. So, you know, it was a spectrum. And then you had the brothers on the complete opposite side who were fully African identified, fully African embraced. Many of them were abandoned by their fathers. Their fathers pretty much treated their mother like, you know, one night stand, never seen them again, you know, probably a slave woman. So, you know, they were fully uh, African identified. And in fact, there was actually a famous story of one mulatto who took part in the 1804 massacre by the name of Jean Zombie. And it goes something like this. One of the most notorious of the massacre participants was Jean Zombie, a mulatto resident of Port-au-Prince who was known for his brutality. One account describes how Zombie stopped the white man on the street, stripped him naked and took him to the stair at a presidential palace where he killed him with a dagger. Dessaline was reportedly among the spectators and even he was horrified by the episode. So, you know, you got to understand it was a spectrum. You know, of course, you had the fully European identified mixed race men like Andre Rigo, and then you had the fully African identified men like Jean Zombie. Dessaline did not specifically mention that white women should be killed and the soldiers were reportedly somewhat hesitant to do so. In the end, however, the women were also put to death, though normally at a later stage of the massacre than the adult males. The argument for eliminating the women would be that whites would not truly be eradicated if white women were spared to give birth to new Frenchmen. Before his departure from the city, Dessaline would proclaim an amnesty for all whites who survived in hiding during the massacre. When these people left their hiding place, however, they were put to death. Many whites, however, were hidden and smuggled out to sea by foreigners, where they landed in cities such as Philadelphia, Louisiana, etc., etc. However, there were notable exceptions for the order killings. A contingent of Polish defectors were given amnesty and granted Haitian citizenship for the renouncement of French allegiance and support of Haitian independence. Dessaline referred to the Poles as the white Negroes of Europe as an expression of his solidarity and his gratitude for switching sides and joining the Haitian ranks. In Port-au-Prince, only a few killings had occurred in the city despite his orders. After Dessaline arrived on the 18th of March, the number of killings escalated. According to a merchant captain, about 800 people were killed in the city and only 50 survived. On the 18th of April 1804, Dessaline arrived in Cap Haitien. Only a handful of killings had even taken place before he arrived, but the killings escalated to a massacre on the streets outside the city after his arrival, as elsewhere the majority of the women were initially not killed. Dessaline's advisors, however, pointed out that white Haitians would not disappear if the women were left to give birth to white men. And after this, Dessaline ordered that the women should be put to death as well, with the exception of those who agreed to marry African men. Sources created at the time stated that 3,000 people were killed in Cap Haitien alone. Philippe Girard writes that the figure was unrealistic as in the post evacuation of the French people, the settlement had only 1700 white people. And you have to understand, I believe Philippe Girard was a, a, uh, he's a Frenchman. You know what I mean? He's a white boy who, you know, is pro French, pro European imperialism, pro, you know, Christianity, Catholicism, pro Rome, Greece, you know, so we have to understand that, you know, when we are reading this information from a European perspective, like I mentioned before, we got to take it with a grain of salt. You know, this dude is not, um, you know, he's not on our side, you know, he is not happy about anything that happened back in 1804. He probably, you know, his heart, his little, his little French heart probably breaks every time he reads about, you know, how to black men you know just ran over them like a 18 wheeler but uh you know it is what it is this is the information that we have because this is the information that is written down and this is why i make these videos because we got to change the narrative period point blank period 
By the end of April 1804, some 3,000 to maybe 5,000 people had been killed, and the white Haitians were practically eradicated, excluding a select group of whites who were given amnesty. Those spared consisted of Polish ex-soldiers who were given Haitian citizenship for helping black Haitians in fights against the white colonialists, a small group of German colonists invited to the Northwest region before the revolution, and a group of medical doctors and professionals and intellectuals. Reportedly, also people with connections to officers in the Haitian army were spared, as well as women who agreed to marry black men. So we got to give a background on the type of quote unquote whites who were, you know, allowed to stay and enjoy the fruits and the labor of Haitian independence. Those consisted of the Polish soldiers who were, you know, under French occupation back in their homeland who were forced to join the French fight. And they realized, like, hold up, we fighting against, you know, men who are fighting for liberty, justice and freedom and equality. And we over here talking about we back home trying to fight for justice and freedom for our own selves. And we trying to put, you know, our foot up the butts of these dudes. You know, we feeling stupid. So a lot of them joined the Haitian side. They were like, nah, bro. And on top of that, let's keep it real. Um, towards the end of the fight, a lot of the mulattoes that were joining fighting the French, a lot of the Polish soldiers and a lot of the many other soldiers seen the writing on the wall. They seen towards the end, like, you know, when a, a sports game is going on, a basketball game, and it's about three minutes left in the game and one team is up by like 27 points. And you realize, like, if you got the option to switch teams, you switch teams. That's pretty much what it was for the most part, in my opinion. I don't think it was just because, like, dude seen, like, oh, let me get on this side of justice. Nah, they pretty much looked at the scoreboard and was like, we getting blown out. So let me join the winning team before it gets too late. Because if they end up winning, you know, they might put us all to death, <laughs> which is exactly what happened. So apart from the soldiers who switched teams and switched sides also the other white people who were allowed to stay consisted of doctors you know because listen man you know our people you know we just went through a war for over 10 years you know we all been shot up you know what i mean desaline and they've been shot up a whole gang of times petro been shot up a whole gang of times you know Kristoff been shot up a whole gang of times you know even the women they on the battlefield too getting shot up the kids getting shot up you know we in the we in the swamps we in the mountains we underground we're trying to hide you know we all oh, we all over the place so yeah the doctors needed to be on deck so yes the french doctors they were allowed to stay the american doctors british doctors they were allowed to stay and uh i believe for whatever reason the catholic priests were allowed to stay but during that time the catholic church had no power on the island it was under full african rule and voodoo was you know the order of the day but the catholic church they stayed because i guess uh i don't know i guess because maybe there were some of us that you know were on that you know jesus you know and heaven the christ so i guess you know we we kept it for our people that wanted to go to church you know what i mean so that's why we left them there but they really had no power during that time they're not they did not have power on the island until they signed the concordat in the 1860s under president Fab Jeffra, where the catholic church actually was given political and educational control over the schools and a whole bunch of land but during the time of 1804 it was pretty much just considered like what the traditional rulers in africa are today they're there but they have no political influence they don't really have any sway on how things are done they're just here for tradition that's pretty much what the catholic priests were there for back in the 1804 independence period and they were spared also they acted as intelligence agents some of them also helped out during the war during the military they would give us information they would serve as intelligence agents you know so um yeah they were given uh, amnesty as well Dessaline did not try to hide the massacre from the world. In an official proclamation on the 8th of April, 1804, he stated, We have given these true cannibals war for war, crime for crime, outrage for outrage. Yes, I have saved my country. I have avenged Haiti. He referred to the massacre as an act of national authority and security. Dessaline regarded the elimination of the white Haitians as an act of political necessity, as they were regarded as a threat to the peace between the blacks and the mulattoes. It was also regarded as a necessary act of vengeance. Dessaline's secretary, Baron Tonnerre, stated, For our declaration of independence, we should have the skin of a white man for parchment, his skull for an inkwell, his blood for ink, and a bayonet for a pen. Dessaline was eager to assure that Haiti was not a threat to other nations. He directed efforts to establish friendly relations also to nations where slavery was still allowed. In the 1805 constitution, all citizens were defined as black, regardless of their origins. The constitution also banned white men from owning land, a rule that would stay in effect for many decades, except for people already born or born in the future to white women who were nationalized as Haitian citizens and the Germans and the Poles who got Haitian citizenship. The massacre had a long lasting effect on the view of the Haitian revolution. It helped to create a legacy of racial hostility in Haitian society. Gerard writes in his book, actually we're not even gonna get into what gerard wrote in his book you know what i mean like i told you before philippe gerard is a white frenchman you know what i mean with the spirit of napoleon you know so 
whatever his opinion on the racial hostility in Haitian society, that is his opinion as a white Frenchman who is no longer comfortable in his original colony. <laughs> so, um, listen, uh, you know, we gave you a pretty much deep summary, you know, why the Haitian 1804 massacre was authorized. Um, when you have a head of state like Dessalines, who's really supposed to be commander in chief of the army, but he somehow landed in the seat as the head of state of a nation and he has the ultimate power and he doesn't believe in diplomacy. He doesn't believe in negotiation. He got a chip on his shoulder from the sugarcane plantations. Then you get what you get and you have what you have. But instead of trying to demonize the Haitian revolution, as they usually do from the European perspective, I think you should just be grateful that it was only 5,000 that lost their lives and not 5 million like on our side. Because, you know, me personally, 5 million to 5,000. I mean, that's still a blowout. So I think you should just, you know, thank, you know, your white Jesus that it was only 5,000 and it was never given the opportunity to rise to 5 million. And you should just, you know, just count your lucky cards, count your lucky blessings. That's all I'm going to say. Um, it's your boy Nefakar Desaline back in the building. Yes, indeed. And I'm gone. Peace.